stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour. tell it to someone, and, well, I guess you've heard a lot of strange stories. I'm Catherine Holland. It all started about a year after I'd come to work for Martin Reed and Stephen Corey as the housekeeper. Oh, we'd have such fun, the three of us. Martin was forever making me promise that I'd be with them always. Always. I didn't know how long that could be. Kathy, you wouldn't leave us. You'll stay with us always, won't you? Not if you keep doing that, Martin. Oh, oh you'll get used to it, Kathy. Oh, but cutting your own name on a tombstone, it's, it's positively morbid. I don't see that. If a cobbler can make his own shoes, then surely a stone cutter can make his own monument. Well, that's true. After all, a man must do something with his spare time. And you, Stephen, of all people, have no right to scoff at me. Imagine a cemetery caretaker who wanders through the graveyard day and night, talking to the dead. If the people I met outside the cemetery, my dear Martin, were as interesting as the people I meet inside, perhaps I wouldn't. Since there are only neighbors along this godforsaken road, and since I must get away from you occasionally... Now, look here, enough is enough. <laughs> are we going to let her boss us around, Martin? You nearly 60 and me twice her age? That's right. And you're 42, aren't you, Stephen? Yep. You know, I think for your next birthday, I'll start on a nice marble headstone for you. Okay, I quit. I resign. Oh, no, no. Don't say that, Kathy. We need you, Stephen and I. Always before, our housekeepers were stout and rheumatic. You're so young. It was like all at once having the shades pulled up and the windows opened when you came. You won't leave us, will you, Kathy? No, I won't leave you, Martin. You promise? I do. If you promise to take your medicine. No. No, I told you, Kathy. I don't believe in that quack doctor. There's nothing wrong with my heart. Oh, Martin, don't be stubborn. It's not a matter of being stubborn. I know I'm perfectly all right. How about those attacks you've had? Well, they were indigestion. You don't want to take that medicine because you and the doc have been enemies for years. You won't give them the satisfaction of treating you, even if it means Please, you... Kathy. Don't you think I'm old enough to know my own mind? But Kathy's right, Martin. You should take your medicine. Oh, now you start. I'm going for a walk. I'll go with you. I don't want company. Now he's mad. Oh, don't take it to heart. He'll get over it. I wish he hadn't gone out in this weather. Yeah. I think it's getting worse. I'll go call him back. Stephen, what's that noise? I don't know. It was just outside the house. That last flash of lightning struck it. There seems to be... Kathy! What? Move away from the door so I can see two No, Kathy, please. Stay here a minute. I'll go up. Oh, I'll go with you. I... I think I... I think I see something beside the cedar. Come on, Kathy. Stephen, you can't be... Yes. It's Martin. He's dead. The tree? I didn't touch him. He died from the shock of it falling so close. It was hot. Crane. Oh, the last tombstone he ever caught was his own. We buried Martin the next evening. There weren't many mourners. We lived too far from town to be well acquainted. At last, the few who'd come went away and left Stephen and me alone at the grave. They've all gone. Your eyes are all red, Kathy. Do you suppose he likes where we buried him? Right across the road from the house? I'm sure he does. 
He can sort of watch us from here if he gets lonely. It won't be us much longer, Stephen. What do you mean? Well, I I can't stay here with just you. It isn't proper. Kathy, you know I wouldn't... Oh, I know, but what'll people think? I don't care about people. They're not important. Well, they are to me. I have a good reputation, Stephen, and I don't... Kathy, intend... don't leave me. Oh, but I must. Losing Martin was unbearable, but if I lost you, I'd have nothing left. I'm sorry, Stephen. There'd be but... no one to care if I live or die. If you go, I'll be all alone. You'll find another housekeeper. Housekeeper? Oh, Kathy, dearest, don't be such a little fool. I'm not a fool. You are if you can't see how much I love you. You love me? Oh, no. How could I help it? You're sweet and fresh and lovely. And I never knew before what joy it was to... to watch a woman. Anything you do, the way you walk and laugh, even the way you get angry. It's beautiful. Oh, keep away from me. I don't know what's come over you. I was content just having you about the house, being near you, but now... Oh, my darling, you mustn't go away. Oh, please don't look at me like that. Please, Stephen. Dearest, let's get married. I'll make you happy. No, I, I don't love you. Don't touch me. Oh, I, I like you a lot. I, I'm very fond of you, but... Well, it's, it's not love. I could never love you. Why, Kathy? I'll make you a good husband. Oh, no, Stephen, no. You're, you're twice my age. But I'd worship you, Kathy, dearest. Oh, would you quit bawling Kathy, dearest, at me like a lost lamb? <laughs> I'm going to the house and pack my things. I won't let you go. You belong to me. I don't belong to anyone. If you don't get out of my way, I'll throw this rock at you. There's someone else. You love someone else. No, no, Stephen. I just don't love you. Don't come near me. I'll throw it. I swear. Kathy, no! I told you I would, didn't I? Why couldn't you believe me? Well, get up. Stephen... He was lying on his back, motionless. I bent over him and... Oh, his face, the rocket caught him between the eyes. I, I couldn't think. I, I was terrified. I only knew that Stephen was dead, that I had killed him. A murderess, that's what everybody would say. They put me on trial, all those faces gaping at me like I wasn't human, and then they'd... No... I had to get out of here. The road past the graveyard. If I followed it, I'd reach the main highway. I'd run. I'd run so fast, no one would catch me. It was dark. The body wouldn't be found till morning. By then, I'd be far away. I had to keep moving. I had to. Where could I go? Where could I hide? Flying down the road for hours and hours. Till my legs were numb and my heart tearing and my chest deafening me with its thunder. No, that wasn't my heart. It was a car. They were looking for me. Somehow they'd found Stephen already. Oh, it was getting nearer and nearer. I slipped behind a tree. <laughs> ones who might have seen me. They'll forget they even passed this way once they're safe at home. Safe at home. Suddenly I realized what a fool I'd been. I couldn't escape a police dragnet by running away. They never stopped looking for me. The best place to hide was at home. Why, of course... I'd gone back to the house from the funeral and straight to bed. Stephen had decided to stay at the grave a while longer. Everyone in town knew he liked to wander through the cemetery, and especially tonight, with Martin just buried. He... he must have caught a prowler, and the man had thrown a rock at him. That's how it happened. <laughs> I felt perfectly calm. I turned around and started back. The sky had been cloudy all evening, but as I walked up the road toward home, it cleared. I remember how lovely the moonlight looked, spilling down the steps of the house. I started to climb. Suddenly, I... I had an impelling desire to see Stephen's body. Well, I tried to fight it, but the thought of him, cold and crumpled, lying like some cast-off doll in an attic, hypnotized me. 
I went down the stairs and started to cross the road. He'd been lying at the foot of Martin's grave, I remembered. From where I was, I couldn't make out the body. Well, that wasn't right. The old man was buried directly across from the house. I should be able to see Stephen. I slipped through the gate. Hurried to where the corpse had lain. It was gone. There wasn't a trace of it. I dropped to my hands and knees, searching about the new mound of earth for some proof that it hadn't all been a nightmare, that I'd really killed Stephen. There wasn't anything. No matted grass where the blood should have dried. Nothing fallen from his pockets. Not even the stone with which I'd struck him. And it was so quiet. So deathly quiet. With the moon whitewashing Martin's headstone. And the one next to it. The one next to it. But there hadn't been any grave there before. And this one was fresh. As fresh as Martin's. I slowly raised my eyes and looked. Stephen Corey, born May 9th, 1901, died April 20th, 1944. Why, I'd, I'd know that carving anywhere. Martin was dead, but Martin had made that gravestone. <laughs> They stand in the moonlight, staring at the grave plaque of Stephen Corey, a plaque identical with the one Martin had made for himself before he died. And yet, how could Martin have carved that headstone? He'd not made one for Stephen before he died, I knew that. Still, Stephen had been buried, and the date on the monument was right. Oh, I felt the answer, but I pushed it back away from my mind. It couldn't be true that Martin had kept his promise even now and had carved the stone. And that these dead who were Stephen's friends had buried him. Had he loved me so, he wouldn't make me pay for what I'd done. Did he plead with them to cover him so I'd not be found out? I didn't know. I was paralyzed with fright. I had to get out of here back to the house before I lost my sanity. <laughs> I don't know how long I lay there, cowering in my bed. At last, the darkness of the night closed in about me, and I slept. But then, out of the darkness, the doorbell rang. Sharp sound, a streak of fear over my flesh. The police had come. Stephen's grave had been discovered. I had to go to the door. Are you Catherine Holland? I'm Estelle Bailey, Martin's sister. Oh, yes, I should have known. Uh, come in, Mrs. Bailey. Stephen sent me a telegram this afternoon about Martin's death, and I took the first train out here. I'm sorry if I woke you. Oh, that's quite all right. Come in. I know it's been a long trip. Perhaps I can fix you a bite to eat? No, thank you. I'd like you to take me to see the grave right away. Martin's grave? Now? Oh, Miss Holland, I hadn't seen Martin for nine years. I'm ashamed of that, and I want to rectify it now as soon as I can. If you won't take me, perhaps Mr. Corey will. Oh, he's not here. He's in town. Well, I'll wait up till he comes in. Oh, you'll wait a long time. I don't understand. Oh, uh, Stephen was quite shocked by your brother's death, you know, and, well, he felt he had to get away from this house, so, well, he mightn't be back tonight. But if he went into town, why didn't he meet me at the station as he wrote he would? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Every moment she sat there, she'd think more and more about Stephen's absence. I had to distract her the only way I could. I had to take the chance that she wouldn't notice that other headstone. But if she did notice it, I would have to kill her too. 
But just then, something happened to spare us both. Oh, what happened? Oh, look, it's raining again. Yes, the moon's gone in. It's pitch black outside. Then there's no use going into the cemetery, I suppose. I'm afraid not, Mrs. Bailey. What a shame. Finally, she went upstairs. I waited until I knew she slept. Then I took a spade and crept across to the cemetery. It was wet and cold, but I didn't notice the weather. <laughs> For I had a scheme. <laughs> a very clever scheme. I was going to dig up someone else's headstone as well as Stephen's and switch the two. I couldn't disguise this new-made grave, but at least I'd conceal who was buried there. It was just before dawn when I slipped back to the house. Mrs. Bailey woke me about eight, and together we went to the cemetery. I came up level with the graves, and... Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. I had switched them last night. Stephen Corey, born May 9th, 1901. Died April 20th, 1944. His headstone. Exactly where it had been before. But I had dug it up. There were blisters on my hands to prove it. This is barely it, she noticed. No. She'd gone right to her brother's grave and stood staring at it, wiping away the tears. I'm very glad of one thing, Miss Holland, that Martin is buried a little apart from everyone else. He liked to be alone most of the time, you know. Even in death, he would prefer solitude and being isolated from all the others. Solitude? Isolated from all the others? But Stephen was lying right by his side. She couldn't see Stephen's headstone. It was incredible, but it was true. Come, Miss Holland, it's raining. We might as well go now. I'll take the early train back to the city. After she'd gone, the house was empty, yet full of a screaming silence. And I sat looking out at the grayness of the lonesome day. Had there really been a grave at all? Growing in sun beside me was a grim fascination to see. The mud sucked at my shoes. Through the dusk, I walked determinedly toward that spot where the headstone stood. I slipped to the fence. Then I was standing beside the tree, leaning against it. For I couldn't believe what I saw. There, beside the others, stood a third headstone. And stretching almost at my feet, a freshly dug grave. Even before I crept forward to see, I knew what the plaque would say. Catherine Holland, born June 7th, 1923, dead April 21st, 1945. Tonight, April 21st, that was tonight, and I was still alive. Martin, listen to me wherever you are. I said I'd be with you always, but you can't force me to follow you. You can't force me to follow you. Tears filled my eyes. I took hold of a hateful stone and tried to flatten it into the ground. Tried to... Then through the tears, I, I saw the dark bruises on my hands. Bruises on my hands, but, but it wasn't possible that... I touched one of the dark splotches. It rubbed away. Then the truth went through my mind. I fell to my knees. The letters. The letters I thought were carved into the stone. They too were blurred. I drew my finger along my name. It was lettered in black crayon. Thick archaic lettering. Darker toward the middle than at the edges. Giving the illusion of depth. Giving the illusion of being cut into the stone. Then that's how Stephen's headstone was made. That's how I stood up. Fear fell over me like a cold, wet sheet. Behind this adventure was a human being. A being like myself. Then I saw the thing in the grass. Sending a tiny sparkle toward the dust-filled sky. And greedily I picked it up. A copper-colored metal cap from an eyebrow pencil. 
So that was how the letters had been drawn. That was how this thing had happened. Then I knew who had done it. And even before I turned to look, I knew she was standing there, staring at me, unmoving, a thin smile on her lips, her eyebrows thin too, penciled on with surety and deafness. Turn around, Miss Holland. I see you have guessed the truth. It was you. You killed him. But do you think my conscience will hurt me as yours does? Would it make your death any easier to know you didn't kill Stephen Corey? I don't understand you. I'm telling you the truth. I came into the cemetery just as the last visitor left, and I saw you throw the rock at Corey. I saw you run for the road. You hadn't killed him, Miss Holland. He was only unconscious. But I made sure he was dead before I buried him. Then you dug the grave here. That spade in your hand. We'll serve a double purpose. I shall kill you with it. Just as you murdered Corey. Why? Why did you kill him? Because Martin had willed all the family property to Corey. With the provision that when he died, it would return to me. I knew if his body weren't discovered, they'd think you and he had run away together. Then I'd have to wait for him to be declared legally dead. And so you put up the plaque. I felt sure I could persuade the county coroner to file a death certificate quietly. Then I'd show my lawyer the grave, show him that Corey, too, was dead. But you came back, so I have to kill you, too. Now you know the truth. Your time has come. That spade, Mrs. Bailey. It's for you, Miss Holland. Stay back from me. Stay back. I'm going to kill you. I'm not afraid, Mrs. Bailey. You're real. I can fight you. This will be your grave, and I shall bury you in it. Give me that spade. Give it to me. Go here. I said that. Mrs. Bailey. Uh, My eyes were crowded with flashes of blackness. I lay on the ground, feeling the cold, wet earth against my cheek. Without warning, it had happened. One wall of the grave gave way, and she lost her balance and fell forward into the gaping hole. Dirt from the mound began rolling down, clods of it covering the edges of her long skirt. And she lay still, silent, at the bottom of the grave. A few wet clods of earth were still slowly tumbling down, as if they had an intelligence of their own, an intelligence that told them to bury the dead, bury the dead. For she was dead, and she had died instantly. Her neck twisted beneath her loosened, flowing hair that hid the hideous sight of her eyebrows, thin and long. Her neck was broken, and she lay in the grave she had meant for me. Perhaps, now I've told it, I can forget the horror of what's happened. But not soon, not soon... One way Martin was right. In my brain, he and Stephen will be with me always. Shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour.